we have 30 participants online. Welcome everybody to our uh, monthly um, ASOMP board, or not board meeting, but annual meeting, membership meeting. Um, does anybody, I have some announcements to make, but does anybody else have any announcements to make at this time? Okay, hearing none, I'm, if I get sidetracked, it's because there's a lot of people that are actually coming online right now. So I'll just start with some of the ones that I have. Julie, did you want to talk? Oh, Julie's on the phone with her mom, so she's going to be tied up for a few minutes. So we won't, we, we, we'll go on to different things. So I don't know how many of you saw the e-news um, that just came out yesterday. Jeff Schultz is doing a portfolio review and that was going to be our February meeting. All the instructions are on the e-news, but if, um, if you're interested in that, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna have people send three images that they'd like to have critiqued and they're just gonna send them to me, then I'm gonna put them in some kind of a Lightroom um, collection and send them to Jeff. And then he's gonna talk about the images. He doesn't want names. He doesn't want any kind of um, stuff on the images that show who they're by. And then he's just gonna go through, he may only get to one person or one picture per person, depending on how many people actually submit. But um, he's just gonna do a critique of everybody's work. And for those of you who don't know Jeff, he used to be the owner of Alaska Stock. And he's been a professional photographer for at least 30 some years. And he is awesome to work with. And I've had him do portfolio reviews for me in the past. And I definitely am going to sign up for this one. So I guess I'll be sending my images to myself. But um, my email address is on the e-news. And you can always reach my email address through the ASOMP website as well. And just send me um, small images, 72 DPI at the most, um, and just send them as an email. And then if you have any questions, just let me know. I'll be around to answer any of those questions that you can, but that's coming up in like a month. And so I wanted to make sure that people had time to, to get some images together. And um, so you could ask him to critique those. So uh, Jen or Gail, do you wanna talk about Alaska Wild? Uh, yeah, we're um, um, up and running for the uh, 2021 show. Um, the call closes on the 20th, so um, get your images in. And um, um, forget the name of the juror. That's really bad. Um, Margaret, can Ron you help Clifford. me out with that? Ron Clifford. Who? Oh, Okay. Um, I, do, yeah, I just did the bio on his web on the website for him. So that's oh great. I'm Thanks. Doing. Thanks. Yeah, I could remember Rob, but not not his last name. Um, also, just want to put this out there. Um, it's already in the rules, but we will not be accepting any that show up with glass in the um, when it's framed. So if we find if we get something that has a glass in it, um, we're we're just going to um, ask you to have it redone um, with plexiglass. We had a we had an incident last when, on the second when we hung the the current show, and uh, um, it um, it made quite a mess. So we're just going to um, just you know we, it's right in the rules, but this time we're now we're just going to be uh, enforcing that more. So um, Jen, anything else? Um, the show is up at Summit Bison Tea until the end of February, the 2020 show. Yeah, good point. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of good comments about it there. It's so actually a really good, um, venue. It's a nice big room and, uh, and the photos look really good in there. So yeah, yeah. go get some tea and, and buy some spices and take a look at the show. Yeah, it was it was fun hanging the show. Um, and I just saw that Amy Bragg posted uh, just an FYI, all Costco photo centers are closing soon. So I'm not sure. Did, uh, Amy, do you know why that is? Um, they are not making any money. They've always been 
um, they've never been profitable. And so they're finally gonna put the kibosh on them. So if you have anything, um, it's, I don't know the exact date, but uh, very soon. Oh, wow. That's good to know. Cause I ordered my Christmas cards for them this year and they were great, but they were super cheap too. So that yeah. that's a bummer that they're, they're going to do that. So Cut off the there, there are many places Let's left see. now. Keller's closed at the end of last year. So yeah, I don't think there's any place in left in town. Now they'll do processing of any kind. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Pretty much have to go with white house or, or an online. Yeah. Right. Operation. right. I know print, printing and stuff, you know, just if you're doing, small images and stuff, you can still, you know, send those through Fred Myers or Walgreens. Um, they're both still doing that. But um, as far as processing or custom printing, I don't know anybody that is doing that. Um, Kathy? Yes. Hey, I just want to give a shout. Um, thank you to Alan for helping us um, get the 2021 Alaska Wild information up on the website. He did a great job. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Yep. Much, you're muchly appreciated. And um, that brings me to my next thing. And that is, do you have any member slides tonight? I do. I have a few from Bert. Okay, cool. Um, does any, um, Margaret, do you have any announcements about hunts? Um, we don't have a finalized, it's up and running. Um, we're waiting to hear back from Noah, but we will have a link very shortly on our website if you want to order any camera computer gear from Hunt's photo, um, they will work with you to get the best prices and 5% of your purchase will get donated back to ASONP and we can put that towards programming. Great, so. thanks. Yeah, the form's ready to go. I just need confirmation from Noah that he is receiving it, so. That it's working the way he wants it to. He, he liked the form, we just don't know if it's working the way he wants. Okay. okay. And um, Julie's off the phone now, so maybe Julie, you can talk a little bit about ATIA. And we wanted to know if anybody had applied. Um, thanks, Kathy. So I don't know what was said earlier. I'm putting a link to the Alaska Travel Industry Association Foundation website in the chat. So if you guys want to go ahead and click through to that and, and take a look at it. But ASOMP for a number of years at the board has been talking about how we can support yeah younger photographers. We tend to be a rather older bunch in this group. Um, so we're, we're trying to engage the younger generation a little bit more and also support them as they go through their, their careers. Um, the Alaska, and so as part of that, we had been talking about how to um, develop some kind of scholarship program. And rather than recreate the wheel, um, we decided to partner with the Alaska Travel Industry Association or ATIA um, who has an existing uh, 501c3 charitable foundation set up where ASONP has created a scholarship within that format um, to award a student. Um, there's up to $1,000 available. Um, it could be one student, it could be multiple students. It depends on, on who kind of comes in the door. But uh, with this particular scholarship, because of the ATIA Foundation, it's um, to focus on college students who are Alaska residents. So that's very important. It must be an Alaska resident um, to um, apply to support their college education in graphic design, in marketing, and especially photography, and with a, a, a travel emphasis or a travel um, connection. So uh, we have to kind of be mindful of that. But if you know or have uh, family members or friends or know of younger people in, in their college career who are going to college and studying marketing, graphic design, photography, um, related fields, uh, have them submit an application through the ATIA Foundation. Um, they will send us the uh, the applicants that meet our criteria and then uh, ATI, or excuse me, ASOMP will have a, a group to review those applicants and, and make a recommendation to the foundation. The application deadline is January 31st. So that's coming up fairly quickly, um, but it's a fairly simple application. It's nothing hugely complicated. And then the only other item to note is that the funds go directly to 
the um, educational institution. They do not go to the student directly. They go to the, the school or the, or the program that they are um, pursuing in the fall. So applications um, for this January will, uh, recipients will receive, their schools will receive a check in the fall of 2021. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But again, if you can look in the chat, there's a link directly to the foundation website. We've also shared it on the, AT or the ASONP Facebook page. Um, and of course you can contact me directly with any questions. So thanks, Kathy, I appreciate the opportunity and thanks to ASONP for sponsoring um, this joint scholarship uh, opportunity. Julie, one yeah. clarification. They have to be an Alaska resident, but they can go to school anywhere, correct? Correct. Okay. Oh, that's good to know, because I was thinking it had to be an Alaska school, too. No, it, Alaska resident in any secondary or, you know, whatever, uh, continuing yeah. education program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Julie or any announcements that they'd like to make? Don't see anything in the chat. Don't see any hands raised. So if you do have a question, check to make sure your mute is off. And if we don't, we are up to 36 participants. So that's how exciting it is that everybody wants to learn how to make snowflakes. So I am very happy and proud to present our speaker for tonight, Marianne Owens. She says, I like to photograph small things, bumblebees, water droplets, bird feathers, snowflakes. I'm mostly self-taught thanks to my parents insisting that I be curious and to keep turning over rocks as I did walking the beaches of Puget Sound for hours as a child in search of tiny crabs and worms with hundreds of legs. So today I write weekly gardening column, try new plant-based recipes and get excited when winter comes around. The other day I saw a plaque affixed to a park bench honoring a friend and well-loved community member. It read, what would you do if you weren't afraid? In these times of uncertainty and fear, it's more important than ever to continue to find joy, inner peace and happiness in everyday things. And if you're trying something new, just remember, motion, breed, motion breeds clarity, don't wait for permission. And most importantly, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going. I look forward to sharing my love of snowflakes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marion. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, can you hear me OK? Raise a hand. Yes. Yep. OK. Um, I'm going to do this in kind of two parts. I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell here. And then I will share my screen and we can talk about more uh, as we look at pictures and we'll learn about snowflakes and how snowflakes, you can kind of read them like a totem pole and um, different ways to photograph them, whether you have a smartphone or you want to really dive into it. And um, so with that, I'll go ahead and start. Um, fascination with snowflakes started probably about 30 years ago. And I came across this a National Geographic article that was dated uh, 1970. And it was called Snowflakes to Keep. And it was written by two weathermen who developed a method where they took uh, a, a liquid uh, plastic, if you will, a, fo a form var, a blend. Um, and it's, it's the material that you actually had to mix in a chemical fume hood. It was that toxic. It was ethylene dichloride. And um, the fun thing about it is that you would coat a microscope slide with the solution. And then you would capture a snowflake and put it in this liquid. And then it would replace the water over about 30 minutes. And you would get this. Um, perfect, you know, these, these permanent replicas, if you will, of snowflakes. And the fun thing about this, and this is what got me really excited, is you could have permanent replicas of snowflakes that you could then take into a classroom and share with kids and put them under a microscope. And it was just extraordinary. 
Um, that was in my film days. And then digital came out and opened up a whole new world in photography. And I came across Ken Lebrecht, and he's a physicist down in California. And you might recall that maybe, oh, I think 20 years ago, there was a set of snowflake um, stamps, postage stamps that came out. Well, those are Ken's work. And I found out about Ken and he kind of became my mentor about 12 years ago and showed me how to set up what I currently use. And occasionally I will send him a snowflake to kind of critique. You know, you talk about critiques. Well, I send him snowflakes. <laughs> He's the only person in the world, by the way, who is able to uh, create snowflakes in the lab and uh, customize them by changing the humidity and temperature. It's just extraordinary. And I'll show you the link where you can go watch this. It's really beautiful. And I love snowflakes. I have snowflake mugs and I make uh, snowflakes, you know, you, you can cut them out and make paper snowflakes. And by the way, six, not eight arms, right? And then my other hero would be um, Snowflake, Snowflake Bentley. <laughs> Hi, Al, yeah. And he's a man in Vermont that you might have heard of that spent probably, I don't know, 50 years just photographing snowflakes. And you can see this book. This is actually a Dover publication, but um, it's just his, his snowflakes over the years. And, you know, he didn't just take pictures of snowflakes. Remember he had a probably a four by five camera, if not an eight by 10. And so he, he had to, using a feather, capture the snowflake, put it on a, um, a material and his camera was set horizontal against the verticalness. And then he would develop it and actually painstakingly carve around with um, a razor blade. It was, the, the process was amazing, just amazing. Um, and then, oh, by the way, this is a really good book. This is great for kids um, of all ages. This little book, which is a field guide to snowflakes is fabulous, it's, it's really great. And then, you know, over the years, people have found me about my snowflakes and here, is an example, this is a scarf and a French clothing industry uh, bought the use of my images, my snowflakes, and they created this scarf out of one of my snowflakes. And I got the most amazing letter from these guys saying how honored they were to blend uh, science and art, and I just, I just love that. And then, let's see what else I'll show you just to kind of get ready for this. Um, let's see. So this is a little bit of what I do, and you'll see images of this. So when the snow is falling, I take a piece of board like this, and this is just foam core. It can be anything. It can be a black notebook, a blue notebook, it doesn't matter. This all has to be at ambient temperature. And I take a very, very fine paintbrush and I have a headlamp on, as you'll see a picture. So day or night, it doesn't matter day or night. I get very little sleep when it's really good snow happening. And then I actually will lift up just like this, a snowflake or a crystal that I'm interested in, and I transfer it to a microscope slide. And you think, well, don't they break? Well, they don't, they're very resilient. And it's kind of like picking up a pancake off of a skillet. And then I transfer it to the uh, microscope slide. And then I focus, as you'll see, holding my breath. And in about 20 seconds, I take the picture. And the reason why you have to hurry is because it's not that it's melting, it is sublimating. It's starting to shape shift in front of your eyes. So why don't I go ahead and I'll go ahead and, um, oh. The other thing I wanted to mention is 
with ideal snowflake photography is to have a source of light uh, underneath it because after all it's ice. And so I use LED flashlights as you'll see in the setup to illuminate them. And then you'll see colors and I will take like uh, gels and then the light reflects off the gels and up through the snowflake. And so this is pretty common to do. Um, I kind of have a variety of colors. I even found this piece of ribbon, which is multicolored ribbon from a Christmas present. And I use that to create sparkle and various colors. So, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and feel free to uh, ask questions in, in the chat and I'm happy to answer them for you. Um, and here we go. I'm gonna minimize this. And I call it the greatest snow on earth. Um, my husband is very accustomed to me um, being gone for a while <laughs> when it's snowing. Um, I absolutely love snowflakes and I, I eat them and I taste them. And um, there's nothing like a fresh snowfall to get me all excited. And I wanted to show this picture because this is one of Snowflake Bentley's images. Um, ironically, he's, he's in Vermont or was in Vermont. And he actually, towards the end of his life, submitted a collection of uh, snow crystal pictures to the Smithsonian. And they turned him down. They said, nah, pff, nah, we're not interested. Years later, they came across somewhere at the Smithsonian, a, a, a trunk full of his images. And so now it's pretty easy to find them. So I'll show you in the next picture here. This is a close up of what my first attempts at photographing snow crystals look like. And this is using that liquid uh, sodium dichloride um, resin that uh, you would then place the snowflake on and then it would replace the water. And then you can use this permanent replica or cast to look at under a microscope. This is what, this is still uh, a picture of uh, one of those replicas. And then I painstakingly, now this is way back in Photoshop, well, I don't know, one or something. And I had to go around and clean up all this area along here and, um, and then copy and paste it onto a black uh, background. And then I wanted to show you this um, website. This is Ken Lebrecht's website and snowcrystals.com. And it is so inspiring. There are tips for kids, how to observe snowflakes, all kinds of facts about snow. Why is snow white? Everything. It's, it's, it's amazing. And this is where you're going to find his videos of snowflakes growing in the lab. And I have a story to share with you at the end about a recent correspondence with Ken. This is what he looks like. Um, he's a pretty fun guy, but it's all about physics. You know, it isn't just snow crystals. He does a ton of, a, of, of research um, down in Caltech. And um, in my beginning days of digital photography and going to Anchorage, this is what my setup looked like when I was first trying to photograph snow. And of course, you have to have your equipment covered up or it just gets inundated with snow and that doesn't work. So this is, um, and uh, Ken, Bear, you, you understand where I am. I'm at um, Janet and Jerry's house. Um, golf umbrellas, tarps, whatever it took, easels to get it to get it right. Now I'm going to share a few ideas and methods that you can use, incorporate um, to photograph snowflakes because there's a lot of ways. It's just tiny things, okay? So this is my first way of photographing snowflakes back when I had a manual camera, this of course is digital, and it's using a reverse mounted lens. 
And yes, this is a manual lens reverse mounted onto an electronic camera body. And the beautiful thing about using a manual lens is that your controls for f-stops and so on are on the lens. You, you don't lose control over that um, uh, as you would with a digital camera. So again, what I started with, I had a 200 millimeter uh, fixed lens. I think I had my Canon F1 then reverse mounted, and then I had a 50 millimeter on the front. So that gave me a one to four magnification. It was pretty extraordinary to use. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I just brought this description. Um, you, can, you can look this up, what you need for the adapters, depending on the camera you have, and then the lens you have and the, um, uh, the diameter of your lens. So, it's really inexpensive to do, and it's a lot of fun once you do a reverse lens for flowers and stamens and bugs, and it's great. So here's another example of reverse mounted. See this person's photographing flowers, and uh, it's pretty inexpensive. Now you'll notice here, this is on a tripod, this is on a, a ratcheting a mounted tripod. Generally speaking, when you're photographing snow crystals or snowflakes, it's handheld. So um, with this kind of setup, it's handheld. And you can get really extreme because you can have uh, a 3X or a 10X microscope objective uh, mounted and you can find adapters for all of this, but you have to keep in mind your depth of field and everything, but it's worth practicing with. It's really, really fun. Um, and then this is what um, Ken, um, I can't remember his last name or how to pronounce it, but this, this is how he photographs his snow crystals. He's got his black mitten that his grandmother gave him and he uses a ring mount flash. And then he uses the Canon uh, 65 millimeter uh, macro lens, which is an extraordinary lens in itself. I've known some photographers that are <clears throat> Nikon enthusiasts and actually, uh, changed over and bought a Canon body just for this purpose. It's a beautiful lens to use outdoors and just small stuff. Now, if you have um, uh, an iPhone or um, Samsung or whatever, this is a very inexpensive way to, unless you have a, an iPhone 12, which of course you have a macro lens incorporated in it, but you can use this, um, set up here, it's kind of a two for one because you have a wide angle and you have a macro setup and it clamps on over the lens of your phone. It's not, you know, it's not um, ideal, beautiful, but it, it works and it's fabulous for kids. So this is kind of what I look like. I'm wearing uh, my headlamp, which is my best buddy and I'm, I'm just dressed for cold. Now what you're looking for, if you're interested in photographing snow, um, um, my ideal temperature might be maybe um, zero degrees or five up to, oh, you know, I've, I've done some beautiful work in mid twenties. It just depends on the atmosphere that the snowflakes fall through. And a snowflake from the time it starts as a little seed in the upper atmosphere to the time it hits the ground or my, my board is about 20 minutes. And it can go through quite a variety of temperature and um, humidity, which is what creates it on its way down. Now, this is my standard setup now. Yes, this is an outhouse tent or privacy tent. And I found this is really great for setting up and then I can just zip it when it's snowing and I can get in and out pretty easily. Uh, this is the outhouse tent set up in our, next to our wood pile. And then I just kind of walk by the barbecue and go in and out of the house right here. So my headlamp uh, is on all the time and you can see I'm looking at, oh, what kind of snowflakes am I going to pick up this time? This is what my setup looks like. 
don't get overwhelmed or dissuaded, but remember this is 30 years of in the making here. And I'll go down um, from top to bottom. This is a loop so I can see the back of my camera. This is my camera here, just the body. I use a, a, a Canon uh, 5D Mark IV. And then from here, all the way down to there is an extension tube. And this is what I purchased from a scientific supply house. What you can't see behind here is a solid, uh, about an inch and a half or two inch steel, stainless steel support. And this is clamped onto that. And then I have an adapter and then a microscope objective here. Now, the camera does not move up and down. What I have here is a stage that micro adjust up and down. So the stage moves. These snaky looking things, this is what holds the LED flashlights and I can position them on top and below the, um, the stage itself and get whatever reflections and stuff I want coming up through and on top of the snowflake. Now, I wanna show you this little diagram. It's really easy to find on the internet. Uh, the temperature starting, you know, zero, minus five, and so on, this direction Celsius, you know, you can do it in Fahrenheit too. So, and you can see where at different um, humidity, but temperature is where you're gonna find your ideal snowflakes, your classic stellar dendrites, your sectored plates, and then your columns and single plates like this. And I'll give you an example of plates. So this is a tiny, tiny plate. It's just maybe a, a millimeter or just a couple millimeters. And it's, a, it's fascinating to see just even the patterns in here. This is a hollow rod, a single, this is, yes, this is ice. It looks like something out of Star Wars. And so does this. This is also a hollow rod. It looks like those, you know, like those Chinese finger things, you know, you put your fingers in both ends. This is one of my favorites is when you have a rod like this, which is how, what first forms, and then you have the caps on either end. And this is sort of double duty because you've got um, a needle like or a bullet, this is called a bullet forming here. And even that is capped. So it's just, it's an extraordinary world to dive into. Um, Marianne, a quick one, question. Yeah. Uh, when you're illuminating that with your LED lights, the light uh -huh. coming from the bottom, is that reflected off a card or are you putting the beam directly into the microscope slide? I do reflect it off a card, Ken. Otherwise, it's too intense. It's too bright. And so it's reflected off a card, whether I have it white or if I have colored gels, it is reflected. I have more control that way. Yep. This one is sort of a soft reflection off of a blue and, a, and a, a blue and a pink gel. And you can see this is a stellar dendrite. And then you have your, your it, they all start here. And this is when I was teaching kids about anatomy of a snowflake. And I got inspired by Snowflake Bentley because he would find these shapes in the snowflakes, uh, classic water bottles and all kinds of things, birds. So I found darts and I found um, duck feet right here, duck feet, um, big anchors. And so it starts here. And then these are called um, ridges and these are grooves that form as they grow. And these little dots you see here, this is called rime, are super, super cold, chilled water droplets that um, just adhere to the crystals as they're falling. And I really, <laughs> I just, I use snowflakes a lot in some of my, you know, composite stuff. And um, I couldn't resist doing this. 
And sometimes I can get a little silly with my uh, my gels. And you know, it ain't easy being green, right? And sometimes I just kind of go a soft pink. Now in these next two slides, I'm gonna show you, these are examples of two like half crystals that found each other on the way down and then fused together. So there's actually two, maybe three here. So it's not we it's not that we have a 10 arm snowflake. It's that we have two different crystal pieces, halves that came together. Like this is one half. See this little eye here? So this half here fused with this half here. You can see it's completely different, these, these arms and everything. And many times the snowflakes will tumbleweed down to earth uh, paired with another. And it's not like I, I have a clump of snowflakes to play with and I try and separate them. It doesn't work. You, you need to have just the single snow crystals if you want to have snow crystals. Um, otherwise, it's actually kind of fun. Sometimes I just kind of go free form and I just hold a microscope slide out in the snow and I capture and I just go, uh, you know, catch as catch can, whatever is there. And I get clumps and all kinds of things. It's just, it's just kind of fun just to um, free, free wheel it. This is an interesting one. It almost like uh, it was struggling to grow and then it got into some humidity and it went, hoo hoo, this is great. But one thing I want to bring to your attention is this flower shape and this beautiful roundness. And I have a story about that in a little bit. More of the, the blue. And then you can see, um, this is kind of one of my earlier ones. Wow, this is just blank before it started growing. And you get these little individual triangles like this. Always a surprise. It's always a surprise. Like this right here. You go, whoa. What is happening? Well, this is two snowflakes that bonded together, lined up pretty nicely. So now you have a 12, what looks like a 12 armed snowflake. Um, and you notice here, this is out of focus right here. So I do focus stacking. You have to because snowflakes are not just flat, nor do they behave all the time when you set them down on the, um, on the glass to take their portrait, right? So I do a lot of focus stacking work and you have to work really fast because like I said, they start to sublimate. Here's another one that is so big that I couldn't get it all here on this one frame. Um, so this is quite stunning and beautiful. And then I wanna tell you a story. I was at my friend's house in Anchorage, um, Janet and Jerry's house. And, um, you know, if, if it's snowing off and on, I spend a lot of my time outdoors and I come in to sleep and maybe just get hot chocolate or coffee or eat chocolate. And I, I sleep in my clothes so that I get up all the time to check to see if it's snowing. Well, this one weekend, things just weren't working out at all. And this is a snowflake that is covered with rime a lot of humidity, and so it's a little bit like the um, the mud over the Golden Buddha, and it just kind of covers it up, but you know, it's like the boy actually who's looking at the, uh, he's digging through the, the, the manure pile, and somebody says, well, uh, what are you doing that for? And he says, well, I, I, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. So you look at this, and you go, well, there's got to be a snowflake in there somewhere. So I was getting pictures like this. They, they weren't the ideal snowflakes that I was you know, hoping for, and and then so I went inside. Pretty well. Let me let me go. So I'm looking at these kind of examples here, and I'm getting a little frustrated. Ooh, this is not cool. This is not working out. I flew all the way from Kodiak up to Anchorage, lugging my gear, and then I'm looking. I'm looking at this guy right here on the left, and I'm just getting a little discouraged. And as clear as if you guys are talking to me, the words, do you still love me, came to my head. I mean, it was like somebody was in the tent with me saying, do you still love me? 
I went, wow. And then, and I went in and I talked to my friend. I said, this is really interesting. I, I, I got to get back out there. She said, well, have a cup of coffee and go back outside. After that, I had the best time taking pictures of these kind of oddball snowflakes. I just, it was like a weight lifted off of me and I had, it was just a blast. So what I'm telling you this for is because what you think might be really discouraging is actually an open door for a whole other kind of creativity. And it was just a, kind of a, a beautiful experience. The other story I wanna share tonight is uh, recently I was corresponding with Ken and um, as a result of, of photographing this snow crystal, this was taken in Kodiak. And when I focused on the center and was starting to take the variety of pictures because it's focus stacked, um, I noticed this circle all around like this. And I was just, I, I, I was just stunned in tears going, wow, there's a, there's a, there's a circle in here. So I wrote to Ken and I said, hey, how can this be? How can you, when you have a, a crystal that is formed by the shapes of the water molecule, how can you have a circle? And he wrote back, this is just not too long ago, and he said, Marion, this is terrific. And then he said, the circle is actually made from a series of curved ridges. And this picture here is one of Ken's snow crystals or snowflakes that he made in the lab. And he talks about these ridges um, along here being curved. And he said, um, that's what happened with your crystal. There's actually 12 ridge sections and they lined up with this perfect curvature to form the circle. And so that was just, um, it was a lovely validation of an art form that I've been working on for about 30 years, truly, truly is. So um, at this point, uh, I'd like to, open it up for any questions that you might have. And um, we can talk about gear or, or whatever, whatever you would like to do here. I had one question, Marion. You mentioned something about a, um, a particular macro lens that Canon, you said something about people would buy a Canon body just for that particular lens. What lens was that? Um, it's this one here. It's the, it's a 65 millimeter, and um you said 60 is, 65 yeah it's 65 right okay. and it's called an mp dash e yeah like mike papa dash e and it's a it's a 65 millimeter a 2.8 uh you you focus manually this is all manual but it is one of the most beautiful macro lenses and you can get either a ring light or you can get the twin the twin light. I've got the twin light, which works with my uh, 100 millimeter macro. I almost considered buying the MP65 and I ended up getting the 100 instead, but I still, it's, but the uh, MP65 is still on my wish list. Well, here's so, um, Alan, here's a book that what got me interested in the MP65 was this book here, and it's called Extreme Macro, The Art of Patience. And cool. um, it's by John Kimbler. John Kimbler, K-I-M-B-L-E-R. And this is a blurb book, but he uses exclusively for his B photography, the 65 millimeter. And this is a very good, and his his blogging and stuff is really good. I'll check it out. Thank you. Uh-huh. Any other questions for Marion? When you focus stack, uh, about how many images do you have to take to get a full snowflake? Um, maybe three to five and then, then I just flat don't have time for it to, to get any more. So uh, I do my best, sometimes a minimum of two where it's tilted like this and I get this half and I get that half. And sometimes I have to call it good, right? Mm -hmm. When, Marion, when you focus stack, do you focus stack by adjusting the focus or adjusting the uh, focal length, move, moving the cam the stage up and down? The stage up and down. Okay. Right. I don't have any control over my aperture anymore because it's disconnected. So I have to just do 
the micro adjustments with the stage. So it's kind of like I have a cable release, I adjust the stage, snap, snap, snap. All this time I'm holding my breath so I don't breathe on it, you know? So it's a lot of, if you've ever done any scuba diving, it's pretty typical to do skip breathing. <laughs> Same thing with photographing like this. I hold my breath, blow it out the side. <laughs> so yeah, focus stacking. Any other questions for Marion? Well, that's a lot of information to take in and don't forget everybody, we do have this recorded because I am going to have to go back and, and read it more carefully because I, I would like to try it, but I'm not, I don't know how much, you know, as far as, um, I guess you have to spend the money to get the equipment in order to make that work though, don't you? But if you have even a used manual lens and then you want to reverse mount it you've already got that so you, you don't have, have to get you don't have to dive in like what i did this is just something i grew into over the years as i began to understand what i needed to get what i wanted but um you know you can get into this very inexpensively it's just extreme macro uh but yeah you're just working with parallel planes there's no polarizer filters or anything it's just right. it's just it's just light Yep. So can, can you explain to me just one more quick time? So you take a, a, um, a slide and put it in this, put it out to catch snowflakes. I think that's I might've... the easiest, that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. it. Otherwise, you know, I have the microscope slide and I can hold it out and just gather a few flakes just for fun, whatever. And then, and then you put the luck, then you put the colored gels underneath it. The color gels are all set up already. Okay. Underneath everything. The lights are on. All I do is I move that microscope slide into position, look through the camera, and I start to work really fast. But otherwise, I collect individual flakes, like one, and I put it on the microscope slide, focus, and do it. So you have your, however you want to do it, just works okay. great. Okay. And what is that you have in your hand again? I forget what that is. This is just black foam core. Oh, okay. But, okay. but you, can have a, you can have a notebook or, you know, anything that works. But it has to be sort of slick so that you can actually take it off. Um, another way to do it like, is to have like a black mitten or something fuzzy. And you can just photograph it in place. You're not moving yeah. it anywhere. You're just using your camera and moving back and forth. It's a lot I, of, it's a lot of hand holding. I did mm -hmm. that with a... Um, a scarf and I have a covered porch uh, in my backyard and so I would stick the scarf out in the snow when it was snowing hard and then I'd bring it into the place that was covered and I was trying to to do that but all my all the snowflakes were so tiny that I you know with just my macro lens by itself it just didn't work to get close enough to really get the kind of stuff that you have so that's and and the ISO I'm using is I uh, is 100 or 200. Okay. So you do need you do need a fair amount of light to okay. um, to work with those kind of ISOs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said the iPhone 12 also has a macro setting. It has a macro lens. It has three lenses. So three lenses. And one, that, that and one's on a macro lens. Oh, so do you have to set it to that lens? I don't know. I ha I have, I have a ten. <laughs> okay. I just got the twelve, so now I'm just really having a blast with it. I love what you can do with it. Yeah. Um, got, so now I, I have twelve to... Pro Max, and I haven't played around with the camera yet, but I I need to experiment. Oh, yeah. it's it's a blast. I've got but a I... little uh, clip-on macro adjuster. You just clip it on over the lens. Mine's an iPhone eight. It works like a champ. So yeah. here's the other thing too is. Um, Using glass slides, like what I'm using, microscope slides, is um, glass is pretty soft and it scratches very easy. So one thing I have is um, I have set up in my tent, I have a box like this of pre-clean pre slides so that I can, and they're at temperature. Everything is at temperature, whether it's five degrees, whatever. And I work with my bare hands. I've tried to use gloves and fingerless gloves. It just doesn't work. I have bare hands. And, um, but sometimes, you know, your glass slides, I mean, there's dust, it's just a mess. And you guys know what it's like to try and clean up. 
um, around something. Well, if you go to canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com, it's one way to clean up the background very quickly. It's AI technology and it's coming out more and more in Photoshop and so on. But it just, it's a dream come true sometimes just deal with cleaning up the background. It's great. <laughs> I know you were talking about that reverse adapter. I, I used to, before I started buying newer camera gear, I had a Pentax KX, completely manual camera. And I had a reverse adapter for my lens there. And it, came, it definitely came in handy for macro work. It's, yeah, it's, and it's inexpensive. It's wonderful. So, well, thank you very much, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk. We know what it's like to talk about something you're pretty enthusiastic about. So, yeah. Well, right. I, have, um, right. I have a couple of things here. One's from um, M. Scott to everyone. Marianne, truly amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your passion. John Quimby, great presentation. Thank you. And Jackie, um, thanks, Marion, for all the wonderful info and ideas. Love my time in Kodiak at your place. And then from Jody, uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. So awesome. Yep. So I even make postcards. So keep cool, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to show us. Yeah, I, I, sh I showed yes. you earlier my little. Uh, uh, drink holder a co coaster i got this from uh it's your your image marion but i got it from ed and george bennett oh yeah they had it for sale yeah so i've got two of those one one's downstairs and i keep one up here at my desk i have a question uh how much magnification did you say you were getting by reversing the lens it depends on your your main lens and what you have on the front so in one case i had a, a 200 millimeter and then reversed on the front of that, I had a 50, standard 50. So 50 to 200, so it was four to one. So I'm gonna wait, pick the right screen. Yeah, it should come up here in just a second. There we go. Yep, there you go. Yay. All right. Yay. So um, another photo group I'm involved in, we uh, decided that we, this is the second time we've done this, where you take an intentional photograph every day for seven days. And this actually wasn't it, but I was out looking for the photograph. An intentional photograph is one where you decide before you push the shutter that it's gonna be your photo for the day. It doesn't tend to be your best photo of the day, but this, anyways. So this is right after sunset along the Connect River. Beautiful. And this is farther up the Connect Valley up there, uh, well after sunset actually. So I really like the, the light that was bouncing off the mountains. And it had thrown the wildlife on. So here's a moose with half a rack. And then uh, I've always wanted to photograph the Christmas tree out there at the Old Glen Interchange. So I, I waited till uh, I thought the light balance was just about right, started taking a bunch of photographs. And then the guy who maintains it showed up and we had a nice little chat about his tree. Did a little moose hunting up in the valley last month and um, a lot of gray days up there, but I like the reflection in the water here. And uh, this is Peter's, the mouth of Peter's Creek. We were yes, looking at that's nice. some uh, uh, ice flows and that sort of thing one evening. The other thing I really like is full moon photography. And so this is actually very dark, except for the fact that the moon was really bright uh, night out near Peter's Creek. And it was really light lighting the place up there but the 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 light has a whole total different quality in the pictures uh on the full moon and this is up eagle river valley at about uh, 4 30 in the morning there was a stream of three cars together that were coming down the road but what happens is if you introduce any other light then it's much brighter than the moonlight. So the moonlight really doesn't do much to illuminate this interchange. But, it's a uh, good picture though. 
Yeah, I did. Yeah. Cool. I got lucky and got taillights from two cars yeah. at the same time. So this well, is a little the, bit a little bit of fog there with a with the uh, uh, artificial lighting too. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah well, that's what like that. that's what caught my attention uh, at first. So this is the the Glen Parks interchange. Yeah. Um, at uh, probably about uh, eight o'clock in the morning. So, but those are my pictures for this month. Cool. Thank you. Well, great. Well, thanks everybody.